Hello and welcome to episode 70 of the Good Good Golf Podcast, Rod Murray at the Tiller, as we take a bit of a detour from our usual type of content this week and do something we don't often do, focus on professional golf. The year's first major is upon us and as the LPGA celebrates 50 years of the a and inspiration, or for those of us of a certain vintage, the Dinah Shaw, we welcome a former two-time winner and one of the best to ever play the game. Kari Webb will join us in just a moment. I'm a little bit excited about that. And then a little later on, we'll also be chatting with New South Wales Open champion and friend of the pod, Bryden McPherson. And knowing Bryden, that is a discussion that could go anywhere. So we'll look <laughs> forward to perfect. that as well. Before all that, though, I must introduce my co-host on this adventure, Adrian Logue. Like you made it out to the New South Wales Open. Must have been nice to be back watching live golf again. Has to be said, it was quite the finish out there. It, it was, yeah. The anyone from the last three groups would have been a fantastic story as well, and uh, some great young players and sort of the you know Bryden is his own story as well, which <laughs> is really fascinating. And uh, it was great to see some tournament golf in Sydney with a big tournament feel. Um, that location's fantastic at Concord. Yeah. People can come from Ticks all, all over boxes, Sydney, yeah, everything. And it it it's a really good tournament venue, and uh, it, it had that big tournament feel, which we haven't had for you know eighteen months now. The Tom Doak redesign, how did it stand up? The scoring was good, but I thought the golf was interesting. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, those those runoffs around the greens are probably the key feature, and it's made it a, a real defence. I think in the eighties and nineties, the defence at Concord was the little greens and tight tight tree lined fairways. Well, that's the fairways are all opened up now, but the and the greens are much, much bigger, um, but their defence, their, their actual playable size is even bigger than that because of these uh, the cooch surrounds that they've got on the greens. And uh, it really does, uh, it, w- it was a great demonstration of how short grass around greens is difficult for the pros, but pretty good for the members. It's, um, uh, you know, the members can all putt from around there and uh, the pros just they chip and they're not even thinking about blading it across, <laughs> That's exactly across the green. Even their heads. No, it doesn't even enter their heads. And, being one of those people, uh, but yeah, that made it. Uh, that was a really great defence, and uh, yeah, Concord stood up well. Good, interesting golf. Great to have golf back in Sydney. We'll uh, we'll talk to Bryden a little bit later. Before all that, though, we must introduce our first guest. Now, I think this is a first for us here at Good Good. That means it's also a first for our special guest. And yet another accolade that she can add to an already fairly impressive resume. It has to be said. Kari Webb's a forty-one-time LPGA Tour winner five times an Australian Women's Open champion and a seven-time major winner. She's also the first major winner, cha- major champion ever to appear on the Good Good Golf Podcast. Kari, time to update the website. <laughs> Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on that, that last one. Really, uh, it goes well with the with the beginning of the show. <laughs> Very kind of you to play along. Uh, on a serious note, are you an a a or a Dinah Shaw? You must habitually mm. almost call it Dinah Shaw every time you open your mouth. I- I do call it Dinah Shaw, but um, there's so many players on tour now that, um, you know, were barely even born when we were still calling it that. So um, if I say that, a lot of them look at me like I have four heads. So I have to I have to then correct myself. So a lot of the times I'll just say A&A, depending on who I'm speaking to, to, so that I know that they understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, indeed. Four heads and seven majors. So mind your place, Missy. Um <laughs> I was just—it's an interesting one, isn't it, Adrian? So often we see this on the men's tour. So often, great historical tournaments that change names, and it's not always great for the tournament. We see people talking about the Genesis Open of 1958 because it's actually the LA, the LA Open. Dangerous yeah. path. A and A have done a good job, I think, in transferring this to the A and A inspiration. Still loses a little bit though, doesn't it? When you lose the Dinah Shaw that we were all so used to. I guess it does, but you know, you, yeah, I mean, it's just the way golf is these days. Professional golf, there's no more Western Open or the LA Open, or you know, it's commercial. All of those great, uh, yeah, those those great regional events. Um, it, it, it's like golf club names, isn't it, Rod? Like golf golf club that's named after its city is is the best way to name yeah. a golf club. Yeah, it's better than Oaks or. Yeah, Riverside or That's trees right. or well, yeah, you get into animal names. <laughs> yeah, it's it all a bit crazy. So, yeah. And yeah, it all gets a bit contrived. But you know, that's that's the world we're in. Sorry, Karen, I'm sure you weren't expecting any of this, but this is how we roll. <laughs> no, but, I, you know, it it is all a part of of professional golf. But you know, I I really believe that um, those sponsors perhaps won't be around for you know 50 more years, and so then then what do you what do you have left to call the tournament? So yeah, it, it just needs- keeps changing. It's just keeps to, changing names all the time. Yeah, got to have an no, identity, was, doesn't it? That works for. A, a, a yeah, tournament. I was very much against when Kraft Nabisco wanted to take Dinosaur's name off. I understand 
from a corporate standpoint, why they want to take it off because everyone knew it as Stone Ashore and not not Craft Nabisco. Um, so once they took um, the Dinosaur name off the tournament, then it became Craft Nabisco. Um, and a lot of people eventually started calling it that. Um, but, you know, it, it's hard for the fans to keep up if the name, you know, if a sponsor only sticks around for five years, you know, what, what um, you know, like a and I'm – I'm a bit nervous about a and It's an airline and they haven't been flying very very much in the last 12 months. So it can't be uh, great to be having um, – they only ha- played it in September of last year and now six months later playing playing it again. Um, you know, so – but if, if a and were to go away, what, what do we call what do it we next? Call it then? And, and fans don't know that, um, you know – they're tuning into whatever it's called next, and then it's like, oh, that's the old dinosaur where they jump in the lake and last, you know. But they only work that one out if they they tune in long enough to to see it. I wonder, Logue, if there's a commercial reality. We say, oh, it's a commercial reality. The sponsor wants all the glory. Would they not be in some ways better off the smart sponsor to say we want to link with that tradition, not lose it? Mm-hmm. So you could have you, you get, get the all, presented by that's exactly sort of right. Things. That yeah. notion where it you is would, jarring having a major oh, definitely. named after a sponsor and and just changing its and name. Of course, we really in the women's game, which is another KPMG and Evian and stuff. Great yeah. sponsors, great supporters of, <laughs> of of golf, but still, there's uh, yeah, it is jarring to see. Yeah. that trickle up to yeah. the majors. Yeah. Well, I think KPMG is still the women's PGA. So yeah. I think know, they'll stick with it. That's a really interesting yeah. partnership, that one that has been – it's probably been the most positive thing, I think, to happen to elite women's golf for a long time. Mm-hmm. They started to mm-hmm. take it to Definitely. great golf that, courses. Yeah. That's a real the major. The PGA Championship was, um, you know, sort of on life support there for a couple of years. And, um, you know, when the PGA partnered with – PGA of America partnered with um, the LPGA – to change it and, and then KPMG coming on board, it's it's probably our biggest major now as far as, um, you know, it's on the best venues, um, you know, uh, outside of COVID years, it's it's the grandest setup, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it has a real major feel to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that the girls, um, you know, love, um, you know, <clears throat> The way that it has changed, especially any of us that have been on tour long enough to see where the LPJ Championship was headed. I still have that image of Daniel Kang in my head. That three wood. Yeah, on, coming into the last with yeah. a massive crowd. It looked like an open championship yeah, or something with that massive crowd. There was a real major, major feel, feel to that. is yeah. what they've done. And, and the, the players should be, but it's their tournament in so many ways, isn't it, Carrie? It's, it's kind of the players' tournament, the, LP, yeah. the, the LPJ. Yeah, championship. well, I mean, the LPJ Championship, which is, you know, it's original – uh, name is the longest running event, LPGA event. Um, the only longer running, running women's event is the US Women's Open, but you know the USGA runs that. So um, this is the long, this is the most history that the LPGA has um, in any of their in the, any of their majors and any of their tournaments. Longest running. Indeed, we're going to come back to some of that history stuff because I know you have an LPGA history buff. But before we go back to professional golf, I want to ask you quickly: they announced yesterday. Grace Kim, Kirsten Rudgley, winners of the Kirsten Rudgley, if I can get that out, winners of the Kari Webb Scholarship. For those who don't know what is the Kari Webb Scholarship, tell them, and you must be pretty happy again, I'd imagine. There seems to be a crop of fabulous players that win this each and every year. Yeah, no, I'm really excited about uh, just the, the fact that we were able to, to run it this year. It was obviously a little bit different, but um, normal normal years outside of COVID, it's um, it's a series of events that the, the, the top female amateurs play around the country and it's some amateur events, some of the bigger amateur events and um, some of the professional events. Obviously, um, there was no professional events this year that were added to the Curry Web Series because there weren't, weren't any um, contested, unfortunately. Um, but um, we were able to, to have a schedule. Um, there wasn't a minimum amount of tournaments that they needed to play this year. Um, and obviously, they didn't get to play in as many as they would have liked. But, um, yeah, Grace Kim... Um, was one of the recipients for the fourth year in a row. So she's the first uh, four-timer, uh, which is great to see. She's Grace is actually over at Augusta National right now. Um, she's playing in the um, Augusta Women's Amateur yep. um, that starts, I think. Brought to you by A&A. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. A&A, Augusta National. Yeah. We'll yeah. That um, yeah it's, um, I think it starts on Wednesday. I think uh, so. Wednesday, US time. So. Um, 
But yeah, so and then um, Kirsten Rudgley uh, from Western Australia. I haven't met Kirsten, but I've heard um, many, many great things about her, and and she's got a bright future ahead of her. So I'm um, looking forward to meeting her, and we're we're still trying to work out whether um, the girls will. Well, Grace is over there now. She's hoping to stay over and play some amateur stuff. Um, but whether um, we're going to to have anything um, over in the US again this year, we. Um, just depending on if uh, if KPMG Women's PGA is allowing crowds. Last year they didn't allow crowds, so we couldn't couldn't make that work. Um, but I actually ended up having Gabby Ruffles, uh, who was one of the winners, um, and another Aussie girl that's over in co- college, uh, Emily Ma. They came to my house for about five days um, in December. So. We were able to to make something happen last year, which was good. I was glad that it didn't we didn't miss out on it completely. For th- for those who don't know, Kari puts her own hand in her pocket and pays for these girls. Generally, it used to be to go to the US Women's Open and spend the week there with you. You don't tee it up as often as you used to, obviously, Kari, but still trying to give that experience. And the uh, as we just discussed, the Women's PGA might be almost in some ways an even better event. Most of these girls will likely go on to a professional career, and that's really a pinnacle of it. So, congratulations again to you for instigating that series and continuing to support it. And Kirsten Rudgley is mm. following almost step for step in the footsteps of Hannah Green. She's, yeah, so, shout out to Sue you Thompson. You do know her, you just haven't met her yet. She's yeah. Hannah Green, but a bit younger. <laughs> That's An- the, uh, another product of uh, Sue Thompson's Sue Thompson, program. Mount over Wally, yeah. Yeah. program. What a oh. fabulous job she does over there. Well, congratulations to those two girls and congratulations to you. Of course, Grace, I wanted to ask you about the Augusta National Women's Amateur before we come to the a It seems I want to ask you about everything before we get to the A&A, Curry. This clash of dates... There are a handful of elite amateurs in the world who have to make a decision whether they play the Augusta National Women's Amateur, which, contrary to popular belief, does not guarantee that you get to play Augusta National, which is an enormous carrot, obviously, up against the ANA, where many of the elite amateurs will get an invite for all sorts of different criteria. How do you feel about that? Part of me can't help but think that in a small way, this is a somewhat token gesture on the part of Augusta National. Well, I think you've read it pretty right, um, but a lot of um, people out there in the media, well, those are the, those in the media that require um, credentials, must, credentials <laughs> yes. um, have said how amazing it is, and it is it is like it, it's so. I don't want to be, um, I don't want this to be taken the wrong way, but it it, it is fantastic that. Um, that there, there is an opportunity for, for these young women amateurs to, to play a tournament, um, albeit only one round at Augusta National. Um, you have to qualify. Not the whole field gets to play Augusta yeah. National. They, they, get, a pra- the whole, they get a practice round, don't they? They play on the practice round. Yeah. Day. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I get um, that, but I'm just, yeah. But, yeah, but, yeah. Um, but they also only get to play one practice round where the – guys that win the U.S. Amateur can play at Augusta National every day if mm-hmm. they want to in the lead-up to the Masters. So it's also not really setting. The, the girls, um, Maria Farsi and Jennifer Kopcho, that put on the display two years ago. Did they ever? Mm. They, I mean, that was best-case scenario because I thought, wow, this could be embarrassing for them. The, the greens are going to be really fast compared to what they're used to, uh, undulating and, and they just played amazing, which was was great. Um, you know, it turned out to be great. But for anyone who doesn't know how uh, the Masters and Augusta National work, is that um, they require if you want a media credential for the week of the Masters that you participate at every event that they have. So um, they started with the drive chip putt back and. and um, the Dinosaur, then the Craft Nabisco, then the a and Inspiration. Um, we've ha- we've moved dates over the years. So we used to play the week after the Players' Championship when the Players' Championship was in March. Um, the media said you get more media out to your event if you move. So we moved to the end of March, beginning of April, um, <clears throat> to the week before the Masters. And, that, and they all thought that was great because then they – you know, they'd have two two majors to promote two weeks in a row. Um, but then Augusta National um, put on the drive chip putt, which was on the uh, Sunday, which required 
all the national media that were at our event to leave Friday so that they were there Saturday so that they could, um, uh, you know, report on the drive ship putt. Um, and then um, three years ago, um, without consulting Mike One and the LPGA, they just gave, they gave Mike, I think, 48 hours notice to tell him that there was going to be a press conference on the Wednesday um, at Augusta National saying that they're having this women's event the following year, so not even giving him two years to perhaps shuffle the schedule so we could move off off the date. And um, so they announce it, and the other media, no national media that want to be at the Masters can be at a and oh, because oh they have to be – in Augusta National for or in Augusta for two weeks yeah. um, to follow the, the Augusta Women's Amateur and um, the Drive Chip Putt and then the Masters. So, so it's, it's um, mixed feelings, isn't it, Carrie? Because you're right, it's a fabulous opportunity. Who wouldn't, if you play golf, one of the very f- – big things you'd like to do in order to play at Augusta National. It's fabulous to give them the opportunity, but this element of it just gets overlooked. They get a free pass, and this can't be an accident. Augusta National no. is not run by people who are not intelligent. They're incredibly intelligent. They one of the, one, run one of the world's great sporting events, and they've effectively um, – they have absolutely diluted the women's first major of the year deliberately yeah. and gotten and- away with it. <laughs> Yeah, well, they've gotten away with it because they're, and I'm using, you can't see me, but air quotes, they've gotten away with it because they're giving back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And It's disappointing, isn't it? Because it yeah, doesn't need to be that I, way. I, I, honestly, I think of myself as an 18, 19-year-old amateur that, you know, possibly could have been invited to ANA and the Augusta Women's Amateur. Um, what would I choose? Yeah. Like, yeah, you, I mean, I grew up just absolutely loving watching the Masters, so you'd want to go and play there. But the hand that's going to feed you for the rest of your life if you play professional golf, you should choose that tournament. That's because a that's the tournament that, that, you know, that tour is what's going to feed you. So um, I just think it's terrible to put those girls in that situation mm-hmm. um, as well. They wouldn't, they wouldn't ever put the men in that situation. They wouldn't say okay, um, we're putting on an event the the week of um, the U.S. Open, um, and so we're inviting the best amateurs in the world to play in it, even though the best amateurs in the world are probably in the U.S. Open or the Open Championship. Um, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't make them choose. They'd just get both opportunities at some point. And, 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 lot- and that's, what I, that's what I would like to see at you know, and, you know, again, we've tried to move, but now the Players' Championship's back in the beginning of March. Yep. So um, it's just it's really difficult. And it's not just moving one week because then you've, you've got to move other tournaments and you've got to have a tournament up against the Augusta Women's National Amateur. So which, which tournament's going to say, oh, fine, yeah, I don't need any media coverage. You know, we'll, we'll go in that week. Yeah, it's... Uh... So, it, you know, it's... The fact that Augusta never spoke to the LPGA at all, they know that they were doing the wrong thing because they know that if they had spoken to us, how we would have felt about it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just you're not giving back to the game if you're not collaborating with all the players, you know, and the LPGA is the biggest women's player in the game and that we, we should have been spoken to about it. Yep, I think that's right. An awful lot of people, as you know, Kari, as we've all heard before, will just brush this off and say, look, it's a chance to play Augusta National. They should jump at it. Uh, that's a bit simplistic, and Augusta National should be called out, and I try to do it each year, should be called out for what they've done in this instance. For a club that prides itself on doing everything perfectly, this is a horrible example of how to go about putting on. And, yeah. and, and Gabby Ruffles has said no to the, the ticket to Augusta both years. She's had an invite both years, and she said no the first year, I'm pretty sure. I think she said no again this year, and she's oh, really? playing the A&A. Well, she turned pro this year. Yeah, no, no, of course she turned pro this year, that's right. But she, I think she would have. I think she was at last year. Anyway, but uh, yeah, yeah last, last year she was due to play um, 
the ANA. She she did turn down her trip to um, Augusta last year as well. So whether you agree or not, Augusta National should be called out on that and the facts should all be on the table. And there's a bunch of facts that people don't think about because they get caught up and swept up in the excitement of the Masters and Augusta National. That's great. We all love the Masters and it's fantastic, including Kari, who still is the subject of one of my favourite photos. I don't know whether you've seen it, like when Adam Scott held the putt to win the Masters. Who were you mm-hmm. rooting with that took that photo, Kari? Actually, we were in Hawaii for um, the tournament um, over there, the Lote, um, and we'd gotten in early because um, one of my good friends, Meg Marlin, was se- wanted to celebrate her 50th birthday in Hawaii. So we had celebrated it the day before, and then Hawaii time, um, the Masters is on nearly like it is in Australia, like it's on in the morning. Um, so we had to get up after the 50th and, and celebrate it. So, but there was a bunch of players, um, we're all, um, watching and, um, I was very careful because what was it about three years ago, three years before that, um, when Adam, Jason, uh, was it Jeff as well? Jeff, yeah, Jeff Agri, that's right. Yeah, had, had a chance to win coming down the stretch, and I'm like, there's no way an Aussie's not going to win today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, of course, Charles <laughs> and, and Charles happened. Wilson won. So I was like, I wasn't calling it at all that day. I was so nervous. Well, anybody who thought Mickelson's five-star jump when he first won the Masters was a terrible example of the Toyota leap, have a look at the picture of Cara <laughs> that Nick Mullen <laughs> took when she got airborne just celebrating uh, yeah. Adam's <laughs> win, which was well, Kari, fantastic. Well, you probably got a bit higher, Kari, when you hold the – uh, hold out at, in 2006 at the A&A. Well. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah, the Bisco as well. Um, it, it, I, I actually felt higher than it looks, but... <laughs> <laughs> it, always, it always does, doesn't it? You know, that's, <laughs> that's probably... That's my enduring yeah. memory. Yeah. Well. Logue feels I, like a I, two I was, mark. I was mid-jump realising that Mikey still had the bag on his back, so it was <laughs> like jumping and pulling out at the same time. Could have been quite nasty, actually, in the end. Before we talk about the a and I'll give a quick look at your history here. Uh, 23 starts, 21 cuts made, 11 top 10s, 2 wins what happened to the two cuts mate everyone wants to talk about the wins carry how'd you miss the cut twice well, that's the last two times i've played it so, <laughs> oh, okay. the so it was 21 for 21, 21 it was for... it was my part time in golf so yeah. I, I think I was, I was 21 for 21 when i was really trying Indeed. Let, let's go with that <laughs> you touched on the history of the lpj and this tournament has an important part in it doesn't it it does yeah um you know again we we um you know, because we've had to, you know, we've had to to um, sell out a lot of our history to to keep um, sponsors happy, either whether it's to move venues or um, to, you know, or the tournament completely goes away. Um, so, you know, 50 years, um, we turned 70 last year. So, you know, two-thirds of our uh, history of the LPGA, the the dinosaur now A and A has been around, and um, and it's been on the same golf course, and and you know the tradition of jumping in the lake isn't something that's been going on for fifty years, but it's it's been going on for roughly thirty years now. Um, and um, uh, Amy Alcott started it um, the the first time she jumped in, and then I think she she there was a year in between her winning and then she won again and the second time she um grabbed Dinah Shore and, and they jumped in together um it and probably then wasn't the, nicely then chlorinated was, back then either was it curry the, oh, the, no. the, the, it, was, <laughs> it was awful What's that? it probably wasn't nicely chlorinated and like no well actually no. the first time I jumped in it in 2000 it wasn't and um uh yeah, stupidly, um, I, I started the final round of that tournament the year I won in 2000 with an eight-shot lead and for some stupid reason I wore a white shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, you need to have more confidence in yourself, girl. <laughs> Back yourself. And, um, yeah, when, I, when I, I jumped in and then when I got out, my shirt was like grey-black. It was disgusting. Ooh. And the year prior, Dottie Pepper had one and she'd gotten sick from yeah. um, whatever was in that lake. And, um, you know, they give you a robe and you cover up and, you know, you sort of are semi-drying off as you're doing all the press and sponsor commitments and stuff after the event. And I finally got back to my hotel room and when I started to undress, like, in in my bra and the waistband of my of my uh, shorts, all this mud and sediment <laughs> oh, was all gathered 
<laughs> in there. Um, and I normally keep all the shirts I wear on a, on a Sunday when I win. And I had to, I had to throw that. There was no saving it mm-hmm. at all. Um, because it just, it was, I mean, it reeked by the time I got, got back to the hotel and it was just destroyed. It was, it was literally black. Would it infected no, your other all, six with mold? It's not, it's not six yeah. major winning shit. It's not a glamour on tour, is it? 2006 when I won it, it was the first year of Poppy's Pond. Um, As we said. And, uh, and it was a nice chlorinated pool. Mm-hmm. So, Kids don't know how good they've got it, Karen. Yeah. yeah, yeah always. <laughs> Always making things better for yeah, them, aren't we? That's exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. Uh, we're going to get Bryden on the Bryden. Oh, we're going to get Bryden McPherson uh, on the line in just a minute. But before we do that, I want to get some of your thoughts on what might unfold at the A&A this week. Who does the course suit? Who are you looking at this week to potentially win? I know you're not in the states, but I'm sure you're well and truly got your finger on the pulse. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know if uh, Mission Hills really favours anyone in particular. There, there's been certain years where um, Long hitters um, do well, but it's so tight and it's gotten so tight over the years that the trees are growing in. And um, I mean, they have cut them back a little bit over the last couple of years, but um, the roughs are always quite long um, and they've moved, they've, they've lengthened it quite considerably in the last um, three or four years. Um, and so it's just, it's tight and long and it just, it, it really just depends. Like, I mean, you, you only have to have a look at the last uh, a few winners. Um, you know, uh, it, you can go from Brittany Linscombe to Lexi Thompson, who are long bombers, um, and they just obviously gouged out of the rough though, those those years because they don't hit tons of fairways. And um, until like a Penilla Lindbergh or a, a Soyeon Yu, who, you know, f- drive it fairly straight, um, so young hits tons of greens um, uh, and has a has a really good short game. So it, it just it just fav- it doesn't really favour anyone in particular. I think it's just um, if it's your week, it's your week. And then if you put yourself there with the chance on Sunday, whether you've got the bottle to. Yeah. To handle it. Yeah. You got uh, you've got to be playing well, I think is the key. So you probably look at recent form and players that are playing well going in. So I look at Minji Lee, Brooke Henderson both had good weeks last yep. week. Yep. And you can't yep. look past In B Park. My goodness, what a player. I saw a tweet today, that old argument that you always get dragged into, Kari, about being you know Australia's most underrated great player and all those sorts of things. We underrate In B Park by about four hundred percent, I reckon. Her achievements yep. are staggering. Yep. Yeah. Game. Yep. Just a I think it's because you can't describe how she plays. You know, like if someone said to me, "What's what's her greatest asset besides mental? How great she is mentally and emotionally?" Um, there isn't anything that she does. Like, like I think if you looked at her stats, putting, chipping, um, you would if you if you looked at her stats, you'd be like, "Well, she must be someone to watch." short game um but she isn't someone i'd say oh you've got to watch how mb plays this shot mm. like i've played with her so many times where i'll be like what is she what sort of shot is she trying to play here and then and then she hits it to a foot and then <laughs> yeah. like, oh, oh that sort yeah uh, yeah i was like oh okay <laughs> so I, I, I think gone about it but i think um yeah she just i mean she puts the eyes out of it yeah. um i've never seen someone holds so many 20-footers and 30-footers. Um, you know, MB will say she putted bad in a tournament. It's because she didn't hold 10 putts over 20 feet, you know. Um, you know, it, that. You know, she just has this ability to, to make these long momentum-saving putts. Some of them will be for par. Um, and uh, I, w- I will say I, I believe she's improved her ball striking a little bit over the years. Um, but... Yeah, so I think why she's so underrated is that most players can't tell you what's great about her, but it she is just so impressive. Um, like she's not a hot, she's not she doesn't go and beat balls all day and you know grind herself into the ground and and she cannot play for well so she wouldn't have played since the U.S. Open last year. Mm. And she just rocks up and wins her first event like nothing. Like, by about seven. Not like, mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> not just not win. Like, mm got to play yourself in the form you know she she just comes out and you know i'm sure inside um 
her, you know, um, um, her emotions inside are obviously probably a lot different to the way she appears. But to me, it's just like I'm just going to hit it and find it and hit it and find it, and I'm not bothered if it's good or bad. Um, yeah. And I think that's what's in. She's not very intimidating, but that's an intimidating um, feature to have because you, she never looks ner- like she never looks like she's um, put off by anything. Um, you know, and if she has a bad hole, she doesn't get upset. And I think that that flusters people when they're trying to beat her on a Sunday is because, you know, they know how they're feeling and she doesn't look like that at all. Mike Clayton described it pretty well uh, when she was going around Royal Adelaide. You know, she, she plays the big shots well yeah. when she needs to hit a full shot pure and get get it to a spot. Otherwise, you know, the tournament's on the line. She does that well. And I think he said she inbies the ball around the course. <laughs> she in, she yeah. the ball. <laughs> which, which is a brilliant she description. Because, of course, you look at her golf swing and you think she's got no right to be one of the very best players in the world, if not in history. Because it doesn't look – there's nothing flamboyant about it. It doesn't look right, quote, unquote. I'm doing the air quotes now, Kari. It's catching. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't because it's this odd motion and that strange takeaway and it all looks very strange. But the ball goes where she's looking. And as you said, she yeah. cuts the dots off it. And before you know it – a little bit like Spieth without the compelling nature to it. I remember Jeff Ogilvie said the same thing. He said, you'd play with Jordan, and you walk off, and you're in the score, and you add up, and you go, oh, he's at 65. Yeah. How'd he do that? Yeah. I didn't see that, and I played with him all day, and yet that's what he does, yeah. and she's a bit the same, I think. Yeah. You know, she's just, yeah. Well, yeah. Without, without being a hot mess. <laughs> yeah, <that's right>. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Mm. Indeed. I actually, I think you're underrated as well, Carrie, so I just want to throw my head into that. Oh, uh, well, that you, I'm on Peter Thompson's team. So it's a good team to be on. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. We're going to bring Bryden McPherson into the chat. One at Concord last week, two wins this summer, which has been pretty impressive mm-hmm. stuff, and get his thoughts on, well, who knows what? Bryden could take the conversation anywhere. So buckle up, Kari. This could get okay. interesting. Stand by. Uh-huh. Well, here's a welcome change, an obvious place for me to insert our weekly reminder to visit the Talk and Golf Network sponsor, thegolfsociety.com.au. TheGolfSociety.com.au is Australia's leading online apparel concept store, stocking all the latest fashions from the biggest names in the game, Under Armour and Travis Matthew, Puma and G4 Shoes, and accessories of every imaginable type. Plus, a 20% discount if you're a Talking Golf listener. Head to TheGolfSociety.com.au and use the code TG at checkout for 20% off, even on sale items. Now back to Curry Webb and Bryden McPherson. Well, from one golfer who knows a thing or two about winning to another who's developed a bit of a taste for it these past couple of months. Bryden McPherson took out the New South Wales Open last week at Concord Golf Club, his second win of an Australian summer that I'm not sure he would have actually expected to be competing in, certainly not a little over a year ago. He's an outside-the-box thinker. He's always interesting to chat to. He joins us now. First things first, Bryden, congrats. What a tear you've been on. You must be feeling pretty good, mate. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's been it's been great. It's been a great little run. Uh, I've been enjoying playing golf and, and also, luckily, having some good results too. No, there's no question about that. I think you've had one outside the top 10 over the whole Australian summer, so that tells you something about how you've been playing. We spoke last year for the Thing About Golf podcast. Well, there you go. Two Thing About Golf podcasts, mm-hmm. guests on one good, good podcast. There's yep. another first. And you told us about some swing changes you've been making with Brad Hughes. He's a bit of a coach of the moment. He's working with quite a few players. Just tell Kari in particular and the listeners out there what your club specs are in this new regime. <laughs> Yes, mine are a little outside of the box with a, uh, I think, well, I use dy- like the Dynamic Gold X7 shafts because they're really about as strong as you can get. And then all my clubs are six degrees flat, which is uh, different, a, a bit different. Um, it, it's still flat by the standard of the 60s, <laughs> uh, a little closer to Ben Hogan's specs. Yeah, that's right. Well, he had very fair. What do you reckon about that, Curry? Could you play with clubs that were six degrees flat? Um. No. no, I'm just trying to show what they look like. <laughs> <laughs> they have the toe like, digging like, in the ground. Like the toes going into the ground. Yeah. That's what yeah. they look like. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, quite remarkable. And this is a question for you as well, Kari, I guess, uh, to have a think about while Bryden's answering. So this great summer comes on the back of a swing change, all that sort of stuff. Two questions. How hard is it to make a swing change at your level of the game when you've swung it a certain way for a long time? And you've made an incredibly dramatic swing change there. And is it the swing that's that's been the difference this year or is it the mental or some weird combination of both? Um, so 
it's definitely difficult to make a swing change, but it's much easier to make that swing change when you're going in the direction of your tendencies instead of away from them. And so for a long time, I worked on trying to fight my tendencies. And instead, what, what Brad Hughes has helped me do is to understand how to get my tendencies to work for me. Uh, and, and that makes the swing change much easier. Um, and so the flow on from that to answer the second question is that I feel like I've always been pretty consistent mentally, uh, at least with my approach and, and approach to kind of staying consistent with my processes, et cetera. But the, now the fact that I'm hitting the ball in play and where I'm looking most of the time means that I can use my short game and putting to win tournaments instead of to make cuts. Well, Kari, we don't think of you as a tinkerer, I don't think. You weren't one that, to the op, to the outside eye, or the untrained eye, looked like you changed a swing a lot over the years. Did you ever try a swing change? And what's your thoughts or your take on what Bryden's just said there? Because ultimately, golf is not a game of golf swing, is it, professional tournament golf? Um, well, I was really interested to, to hear what um, Bryden's been working on with Brad. Obviously, you know, he is... Um, has helped a lot of guys recently. So I was, it's very, a very interesting approach. And um, I find it funny that you think that I, I wasn't a tinkerer. I probably wasn't, um, I wasn't early on um, when I was only working um, with Calvin Heller, who I grew up with. Um, it was very basic and um, I wish I had have stayed there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I know I, you know, um, you know, at the time I, you know, was the best player in the world and and um, I think if I could, I don't have any regrets, but I think if I could have changed, um, uh, altered my course slightly when I when I wanted to maintain being um, at, at the top of the tree, I, I wouldn't, I, I couldn't hit a fade. Um, so I felt like that was the next step to being better, but that, that, um, well, I could hit a, I could, I could hit a, my version of a fade, but I couldn't hit a true fade, and so that literally um, started a, a, um, a chain reaction of changes that literally I'm still, <laughs> still working through. <laughs> uh, so um, I liked that. Um, I, that's why I was interested in, in what Bryden said about Brad is that maybe I should have just kept to, to doing what I was good at and. And, you know, what I should have done was maybe gone. Um, and the one thing that I think I, I um, learned tremendously from when I started working with Ian Triggs was short game and understanding processes of short game. I never really, you know, my short game was pretty tidy, but I didn't, you know, I didn't, um, didn't really have any processes to working any of that out, or I wouldn't. I wouldn't have been able to give someone a lesson on short game. I didn't really understand what I did myself. Um, so you know, to me, I should have just gone down that route and but become. I was a. I was a really good putter, or I was pretty average. So I. I think I should have gone down that route of becoming a better, um, a more consistently good putter, and and you know even worked harder on my short game rather than trying to hit a fade. Um, <laughs> I did succeed in hitting a fade, but um, going on what Bryden just said, I, I did definitely go away from my normal patterns in my swing to do that. What is wrong with you guys who can play this game who are <laughs> never satisfied with having almost everything? Bryden, I suppose your results in some ways, you had a, you've had a bit of a roller coaster career, haven't you, really? You've done some fantastic stuff there in China. You've always struggled a bit when you've gotten back to the States. So I imagine that you're constantly searching for an answer to those questions. But surely it just makes sense to go, look, I was good enough to get to here. It must be good enough to go the next step. Why can't players accept that, Bryden? Uh, I would suggest that there's a that part of the reason why you become as good as someone like Kari is because you have the never satisfied tendency. Mm -hmm. So I think that's partly a trade off uh, that you get with the best players is that that's kind of what you have to manage. Uh, 
I'm not speaking from experience because I'm not one of the best players, but I do know some of them. And gone all right the last couple of months, mate. Mm-hmm. You've really, and I think you've moved up hundreds of spots in the world rankings. If I saw something yeah, the other day, yeah, so. we're getting there. But I pale in comparison to uh, some of the better players around. So the the thing that I've noticed is that the best players, none of them are ever satisfied in in some or sometimes all respects. And I think that that's the tendency that they fight um, when it comes to developing their game. And sometimes it can just be luck and it can just be timing that there was the wrong person there at the wrong time or the right person there at the right time that stopped them from going down a rabbit hole. I think it can be that broadly defined. Um, You know, there's obviously lots of nuance involved, but I think that that's that's something that, that all, and I think the game attracts people who are especially prone to, uh, you know, self, self-critical and, and uh, perfectionistic traits. Mm. You didn't have your best stuff early in the day Sunday at Concord. I think you started the day with the lead, if I'm not mistaken. And, of course, guys shoots lights out. We've seen the scoring this year has just been crazy on some of the courses that we know that we've played and we think, how do they do that? These guys are incredible. <laughs> you didn't have your best stuff, and yet you emerged victorious at the end of the day. Would Bryden McPherson 2016 have pulled that off, do you think? Has there been any change there? No, I wouldn't have pulled it off um, because I I couldn't uh, knowingly stick stick to the same uh, plan for the whole day, but also be able to stick to the same swing feel uh, and sort of know that if I can f- get the feel right, that I will hit good shots. Um, those are the two biggest changes for me. I mean, it became pretty obvious to me quickly uh, in the day that I I didn't have everything that I've got early on, and and that can change as the as the round goes on. I mean, like as Kari knows, like a lot of what we're doing is like kind of riding the streams of momentum and like trying to get trying to get in. Sometimes you feel like you're on the outside looking in, just kind of waiting to get in there. Um, so you can have rounds where you don't feel that good in the beginning, and then it turns into a great round. That's possible, but. So it was definitely one of those for me. And so I had two choices. I said, well, I either stick to the plan and catch fire and we'll be good to go. Or I stick to the plan and play solid and shoot a good score. And maybe these other kids get nervous. And it was, those were the only two scenarios in which I was going to win the tournament. And both of them required me to just stick to what I was doing. And so that's what I did. I had a couple of opportunities on the front nine to hit some miracle shots and chose not to played it safe or well, not safe played it smart and stuck to what stuck to what I'd said I was going to do all week. And then luckily for me, a couple of the, the boys did get a little nervous and uh, they made a couple of mistakes. And then I was able to, when it came to it, grab my opportunity and then kind of, uh, you know, twist the knife a little bit in there around the back nine. So Ooh, I love the language. Ooh, yeah. Love the language. <laughs> G'day. That's great stuff. G'day, Brighton. Adrian Logue here. I was actually yeah, Adrian, yeah. I was out there on uh, Sunday following around and I, I do I did notice at the start it was a bit of a nervous start. Um, had to get up and down for par on the first where you know some players were driving the first and there was and uh, the third I think you were in the trees on the left there and I'm assuming that's one of the miracle shots that you were tempted to do there to hook it round yep. hook around that tree mm-hmm. um but i did i i thought oh bryden's you know not got his best stuff today but there's something i've observed in tournament golf where and it's more mental than physical i think where some players just seem to be sprinkled with fairy dust on a certain day and you can just tell there's an aura of not invincibility but an aura of sort of confident uh uh, you know they're, they're gonna contend like they're they're not gonna fall away and I, I think you had that about you in some ways you know the the other guys you were very much in your own world sort of a hogan-esque type of oh, bubble that you were in um and be I, careful throwing that around look, I, no, I heard, <laughs> you I, got his clubs <laughs> i heard other people mention that actually that uh, there was sort of this hogan-esque sort of feel about the way you conducted yourself on sunday um when you know a lot of the other guys were sort of friends and chatting, and um, you know you were doing your own thing and very focused, um, but is it, that mental? Is that mental strength that sort of carried you through 
on Sunday? Is that uh, is that something um, that you? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, look, you know, it's it it can look like all kinds of things from the outside. Um, for me, it's just stay stay in the plan, stay in the in in what you're doing, and uh, and keep it. You know, even though it looks super focused and all these things, it's pretty it's pretty loose on the inside. You know, I'm I'm not I'm trying not to I'm not trying, you can't really try not to stress, can you? But uh, I'm <laughs> sort of I'm sort of it's a bit of an oxymoron, but, like fun um, run or joy flight. Makes yeah, sense. that's right. <laughs> I mean, but you know, and and I was uh, you know not having huge conversations with the boys and stuff, but. I was uh, I was giving them a hard time now and then, especially the caddies a little bit, you know, because they, they were a little nervous and stuff, and, and we were kind of bantering a little back and forth, and um, you know, I always always making sure that I'm telling them that they hit, hit a good shot when they hit a good shot, all these things, and, and uh, especially when they bounce back uh, from making a mistake, I think it. I wish that in some of the situations I'd been in, that some of the more experienced players that I'd played with had pointed that stuff out to me as important and impressive. So I make sure to do it to the kids. I say kids and then 22 or 23 or whatever. <laughs> they feel like kids to me anyway. They are but, kids. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I kind of simultaneously hold it in hand. It's, it's, I say, look, you know, well done. Great job. Uh, that was that was a really great birdie, but I'm I'm sorry, but I'm gonna I'm still gonna win this <laughs> tournament. Going to yeah, like that's, yeah. Um, I, and I think that's a I think that's a good environment for them to be in to know that you're good, but also know that someone that might be more experienced than you still wants to beat you. That's another level of respect, right? Because if I didn't respect them, I wouldn't care. Wouldn't care, right? Uh, uh, but I I do care. You know, I think it I think it matters. Uh, the experiences that these kids get to go through. Uh, then I go using kids again, but uh, I think that kind of stuff's really important. Uh, and I and I wish I'd had more of it when I was younger, uh, instead of just being pulled up on my etiquette. I, I want to come back to some of that stuff about the kids, Brian, because I think there's some really interesting stuffs happened over the summer here in Australia, which will be really important in five and ten years' time for some players' careers. They'll look back and say important stuff happened there. You might be a part of that, but Kari. Is what Bryden's saying there resonating with you? We who can't play the game and those of us on the outside want the secret to be incredibly fascinating, interesting, and at some level that we can only understand abstractly. Is it really just as simple as being in the process? As he's talking about there, you've won a lot of golf tournaments. You can't have had your best stuff every single time. No, but, I mean, if, if you're able to stay there, then, then that is when you go on to win. It's when... Um, when you go away from it and you um, start pressing or or not understanding the situation that you're in, um, that things continue to, to, to go in the wrong direction. Um, you know, and I, I have won plenty of times where I didn't feel like I played my best, but it was just about managing my game and, and um, I think also just willing, willing myself to, to hit the shots when I needed to. That other thing that uh, – it's always struck me one of the most important lessons that young wannabe professionals need to learn is you don't have to have your best stuff to win and it might be the hardest lesson to win because we all watch from the outside and people who are winning tournaments look like they're doing unbelievably amazing things almost all the time. But mm. Well, it kind of looked like Bryden was shooting 40 on the front nine on Sunday uh-huh. but at 35 but and then 30 to 35. But it was still in position and – yeah. You know, so it's, I imagine that's a hard lesson to learn. Kari, did you find that a hard lesson to learn early on? You think you've got to do everything perfect to win, but actually you don't. And then that same question for you, Bryden, I think, because the experience you've given some of those kids with what you were saying earlier is really important stuff too. Yeah, I think um, I think I um, well, my first my first win, um, you know, I, I played played really well, but the next time I won. I didn't, and that was when I was um, just a member of the LPGA, and I didn't feel like I had my best stuff, and I won, and I couldn't quite understand that because I, you know, I was now playing on the LPGA, and I didn't understand how I could win um, and not be playing at my very best because I was playing against the best players in the world, and I, I think I, I slowly learned that, you know, rarely do. You, do you have your best? Like, especially for four straight days. Mm, um, such a moving target, you know, isn't it? <laughs> you might might throw in um, a couple of good rounds and then and then turn a turn a 
72 into a 69 on a day that didn't didn't feel great. But that those are the rounds that win you the golf tournament, not the days where everything's clicking and you and you shoot 64. Um, it's the turning par rounds into three unders and four unders, um, and you know just refusing to allow yourself to think that things aren't aren't great. Um, and I, that that is all mental because you know I, I there's been plenty of times where I could have shot 68 or 69 and I've shot 73 because I just didn't believe I had I had it in me that day so um you know it's definitely a mental state that you have to be in to to you know just to keep pushing and keep believing has that been the realization for you in some ways Brighton I do think it's probably one of the hardest lessons to learn isn't it from the outside you watch Tiger Woods in his prime or Dustin Johnson now they hit it 350 down the middle of every fairway they wedge it inside 10 feet they make every putt if they miss a green they chip it to a foot it all looks kind of perfect if you look at it in a certain light doesn't it has that been a hard lesson for you to learn and do you think you've learned it now if it's learned <laughs> yeah I mean the, the the perfect light being on TV where they only want to show good shots um, yeah I mean look it's it's uh, I mean everything that Kari said there is obviously a hundred percent true uh i i just think that the idea that you don't have your best stuff quote unquote which you you hear a lot of people say um it that simply refers to the physical um there's very few occurrences when you win uh win a, a, a like a decent sized golf tournament where you're all over the place mentally all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that doesn't that that does happen, um, but it happens much more often that you don't have your best physical stuff than when you don't have your best mental stuff. Um, and so I think it kind of speaks to the the broader nature of the like what it actually takes to win golf tournaments. It's so much less about the actual physical and more about the actual in the moment execution of process and things like that is what is uh, truly important. Um, And being that the game itself, the whole, you know, the game has so many variables, right? And everything in the game is so counterintuitive, right? Hit down on it more to get it higher or um, swing it smoother to hit it further, whatever your various counterintuitive things are. I think there's another more meta one where it's – there's so many variables in the game that the way to be consistent is to just stick to the same thing over and over. Control uh, the one thing and, you can. Yeah. Yeah, and like everything else. Professional golf, tournament golf's always um, struck me as a bit of a – I'm going to let you go into McIncurry because I know you've got some things to do. But I want to ask this question of you. It's a weird time warp, isn't it? it takes four days, takes all day to play, play the last round. It's all happening so slowly and yet somehow – in the moment, everything's happening so incredibly quickly. Give us a couple of thoughts on that, Gary, and then I'll let you go. Yeah, no, uh, for sure. I think um, you know whether whether it be um, on a Sunday when you have a chance to win, um, or um, you know, just even a round where you know maybe the first round of a major where you're you're really nervous or the anticipation of just getting getting going and off to a good start. Um, you know, um, I describe it as. You know the the days or the tournaments or the or the wins. Um, you know, brain's quite peaceful. Um, there isn't a lot of um, noise in there. Um, but when the days when there's a lot of noise in there, everything seems to happen very fast um, and 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 never in the in the good direction. <laughs> if, if, if your if your brain's that noisy, and and so I think that's the the challenge is to learn you know learn how to to quieten your mind so that you can follow the processes if it's noisy and and loud in there um you'll, you'll get off track pretty quickly and and you won't you won't have the discipline to, to, to stick to your processes but when it is quiet um you know it's it's much easier even when things aren't going great um to get back on track I look forward to one day feeling that, Kari. It's been- I, can, I can obviously relate when I've, I've turned like an 88 into an 83 or yeah, something like well, that. Exactly. It's yeah, exactly. It's a round of golf. Yeah. Kari, it's been fabulous of you to take some time to chat. We always enjoy chatting to you. It's been fantastic again today. Uh, best of luck. There's nuggets in there for any kids who are listening if they uh, pick it apart and have yeah. it. Yeah. We'll talk, guys, talk again soon. Again. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Kari. Kari. See you. Bye. Bye. One of Australia's greatest ever. Every time I speak to Kari, I feel privileged. 
to be honest with you. And she's so nice and down to earth and just like, you know, anybody else that you might meet. But she's uh, she's fabulous. Bryden, back to you, my friend. Um, I guess part of the question now is, now I know you were on the Inside the Ropes podcast yesterday, which I haven't had a listen to yesterday. Your challenge today is to not retell any, not to say anything <laughs> on this podcast that you said on that one because they need to be different. We've probably got some crossovers. Okay. We well, might have some crossovers. Uh, the last year's been obviously crazy for everybody, but I imagine for you in some ways in particular because you were living in America, you were doing a certain thing, the whole world collapsed, you moved back to Australia. Now suddenly you found all of this success. What's next for Bryden McPherson in that case? Uh, I'm just sticking to the same plan. Um, you know, I mean, our plan, my wife and I, we decided to relocate out of, uh, Florida. Um, we took the opportunity that coronavirus, uh, dealt, uh, those of us that were able to take it, which is to look at, uh, the, the other aspects of our life outside of professional and say, do we want to live here? And, uh, you know, the answer for us was that, no, we don't. So we uh, were looking at Hawaii and we were looking at, because she's from Hawaii, my wife, and we were looking at Melbourne and uh, we went through and, and did some pros and cons and ended up uh, still exploring the idea of Melbourne. Um, she hasn't fully decided yet. She's coming down at the end of April uh, and so she'll get the final say, obviously, and uh Obviously. And then, obviously. <laughs> Anybody who's married, you didn't need to say that. <laughs> Everyone knows that, obviously. I know, but, but for those who don't. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so I think that uh, once we can get that sorted, you know, I mean, the, the little run that I've had, and as, as you alluded to, the run up the world rankings that I've had also it opens up a few doors for me, but I'm not rushing uh, anything over the next six months. Um, you know, if I get some opportunity to go somewhere and do some cool stuff, like maybe play some European tour events or something, I very much doubt that will happen. But it might. You never know. Um, well, it won't with that attitude. I, I, I would. Yeah. I mean, I would. I would think about it. But you know, it's it's not a no brainer for me. I'm looking at Q schools at the end of the year, and I've still got some work to do uh, on my on my swing on my ball striking um, to get it where I want it to be, uh, and. Uh, so I don't have as many days like I did on Sunday when I've got to really grind uh, and really just sort of force it to work. Um, I would like to be under the pump and, and uh, be able to really control my golf ball. That would be awesome. The strength of fields we've got here in Australia, nobody's pretending that they're the strongest fields in the world. However, you've played all over the world. How does this stack up? What does this tell you about your game in terms of the trajectory you'd like to be on and where you'd like to end up? How does this compare to the Corn Ferry Tour, the PGA Tour, the European Tour? Because in your own mind, they're the questions you need to ask. Where am I in that big pool? And what do these wins tell you against the fields that we've had here these last few weeks? Yeah, I certainly have asked myself that those questions for a long time. And I've just stopped asking myself those questions. Because <laughs> I apologise. No, no, no. Because I, I, it's just not – it hasn't been good for me uh, to constantly be asking myself that question. So I only ask myself one question now is that where am I compared to where I was, you know, a month ago or a week ago or yesterday or whatever, like depends on the, the scope of what you're working on. If you're working on your swing, where am I compared to where I was three months ago? Or if you're trying to compete in a golf tournament, where am I mentally compared to yesterday? And the answer to that is hopefully the same. Uh, and so when the opportunities come for me to go play events, I'm going to be going to play events and I'm going to be comparing myself against how I have been playing in the past. Uh, and I'm definitely playing much better, um, much more consistently than I have in the past, hitting the ball much more consistently, especially approaching the green. Uh, and um, I, in, the, in the, the time off between the first four events after I won at, at Muna Lakes and uh, and then when we started at TPS Sydney at Bonnie Doon, I went back and had a short game lesson with Dennis McDade because me and Dennis worked together for a very, very long time. We're still very, very good friends. And um, I called him up and I said, hey, my short game is not what it used to be. Uh, and so I would like to come and get a short game lesson, please. And that for me represents a, a big jump in maturity 
to be able to say, yeah, I really like this stuff and this works really good. And so we're just going to work on this. And we got back to a couple of simple things and it was my short game that won me the event last week, my short game and my pitching. Um, uh, I, I would not have competed with the short game that I was, that I was rocking at Moodle links cause it was awful, but I was striking the ball much better. So it didn't matter. Um, so there have been a lot of things, uh, as far as personal development, professional development for me over the last little while. And it's, it's nice to reap the benefits, but, um, you know, it doesn't change the plan or the path that I'm on. Uh, it just maybe gives me a bit of a shortcut to maybe a second or, or a final stage of a Q school at the end of this year. I always find talking to Bryden so zen, mm-hmm. Adrian. Mm-hmm. I, I suppose golf is different to a lot of sports in that, in that it unfolds in a way that allows more sort of time to think it can be the enemy during tournament golf. But the, the mind can be really the enemy of the golfer, can't it, with so much time. Like, mm-hmm. And even at our level, though, it's probably – it's probably the most costly, uh, bad part of our game is the way we think about negative thoughts. The game, yeah, yeah. and negative, bad self talk, yeah. and just poor decision making. Well, I kind of want Bryden to make all my decisions for me. It would be nice in life. <laughs> I know? was just like, going to say, if you could, could do that for me, Bryden, that'd be that'd be great. <laughs> like just just hearing you, the way you uh, thought through where you want to set yourself up mm. in you know to live. I think that was pretty instructive as well, and obviously that carries through into your golf game there, there was a decision on sunday on the 18th you you chose to chip uh chip that shot from just off the green on 18 and you put it stone dead uh, i would have putted that for sure <laughs> but that it seemed like with three with three shot lead i don't think there's a lot of risk of you blading it across the green and, <laughs> <laughs> that. uh, well you know what were you thinking i tell you what it did enter my mind because <laughs> i thought everyone's probably expecting you to putt this uh and and you know all i had to do is really get it on the green and two putt or down in three from 12 yards uh six of those yards being fringe um the thought did cross my mind that well it's harder to it's harder to flub a putt or blade a putt right and all i got to do is get this onto the putting surface but I took that moment and I said, well, you know what? You've been doing a lot of work on your short game and it feels pretty good. So how about you hold this chip? How about you chip it and you hold it and put a nice exclamation point on it uh, instead of shying away from the challenge? Um, And so I just went through my process there and – and hit a great little chip there. And, and that was a cool feeling. Um, and uh, walking up and putting a mark on it, obviously, because you don't want to take anything away from the other boys who are trying to make a birdie to uh, to increase their winnings of the week. Um, and Jack actually hit a phenomenal putt that only just missed. Uh, he did it on 17 as well. And uh, he deserved one of those to get a bigger check. But he won't be disappointed, I don't think. Jack, uh, Jack Thompson and yeah. Jack Thompson, yep. yeah, and um, yeah. So that was the decision that I made. That uh, I try to do that when I can. Try to make the right decision, and in that moment, the right decision is to chip that. Uh, and but the because the right decision fluctuates somewhere between too safe and too aggressive, right? So. It's the the decision that you would make most of the time is the right decision Uh, and letting the situation affect things too much is never a good thing. Mm. That's an interesting insight about – it's not that pro golfers aren't fearing these things. It's that they can face the fear and trust trust their process and execute. Ultimately, golf is a game of – understanding your own physical capabilities and matching them to the decisions you're making. And so for poor golfers, if I hit it in the trees on the left of the third at Concord, I'll try to hook it around the tree. I can't hit a hook, but it won't stop me from trying it. Mm -hmm. Whereas Bryson can hit a hook, so the calculations are somewhat different, but the decision is the same. He can hit a hook, but there's no great merit in doing that because the risks don't match the potential. Is that something like that? at times, like Bryden – and I'm interested in your thoughts on this. You, you've got a lot of power when you need it, it seems to me, and and that was very useful on the 13th when you made eagle. Um, 
and uh, it was one of those times where I think, oh, you know, it's worth taking a risk here, and it seems to be. That, that, was that your thinking there on thirteen? It could really make a yeah, move. So, so a couple of points on that. Um, like, firstly, uh, for those that don't know, uh, if you look at just some basic data like strokes gained, uh, if you are 150 yards away from the flag and you are in the trees, the only way that you can lose strokes on the PGA Tour average from there is to hit it about 40 yards backwards into the fairway. So if you are in the trees and you play straight sideways back into play, you are gaining strokes on PGA Tour players. That's a staggering step, mm-hmm. isn't it? I've had so many opportunities to gain strokes on PGA Tour players because the more time you're <laughs> right. spending the trees chipping out, the more strokes you're gaining. Yeah? Is that how it works? That's how it works. <laughs> That's an so, amazing stat. I mean, what happens after you hit it back into play is obviously important. Uh, but uh. <laughs> once you are, so long as you are not going too far backwards and into play, the correct thing to do is to choose a shot that puts you back in play that you can pull off at least nine times out of 10, Mm -hmm. Uh, hopefully 10 times out of 10. Um, Because so, and if you can understand a couple of basic things about the game like that, the decision on the third, which is that exact decision Adrian, Mm -hmm. that I had where I, I was able to actually advance the ball forward and, about forward about 60 yards and into the fairway. Um, that actually gained me probably about a third of a stroke on a PGA to average wow. from there. So not to mention taking double bogey out of play and keeping me in, in, in and I actually very nearly made par. Mm. But um, so, and then when it comes to, so understanding risk is really important. when it comes to golf and understanding what risk you're taking and what reward you're going to get for it is even more important. That's the next step, right? So what are my risks and then what are my rewards for taking those risks and then choosing which one you, and choosing the best fit option is, um, is that's, that's what you have to do when you are strategizing a golf course. And the 13th, at Concord is a perfect example of that. It's a very short par four, very reachable. It's only driver because it was into the wind that day. Uh, on Saturday, I hit three wood under the green. And the trees block the left-hand side of the, goal, uh, of the, of the green. And, but all of the shots from the right-hand side of the green and in the right-hand bunkers are a little bit more difficult. So, but it's still, you still get a better chance of getting it close from there than you do from 60 yards in the fairway. So it's always the best option to go for that green because it's wide enough to fit your driver or your three wood nine times out of 10. So what you have to do is find the correct position to aim, which is the right edge of the front green side bunker. So that pin was on the left, uh, tucked behind the trees. And I was aiming at the right edge of the front green side bunker thinking that if i pulled a little bit it'd be fantastic if i push it a bit it'd be on the right hand side of the green and i'd have a difficult putt down the slope but still a good chance of making birdie and then i just pulled that drive just a little bit and as it was in the air all i was saying to it was like miss the trace <laughs> miss the trace and then there are a few people uh clapping up by the green so i had assumed that it was in a pretty good position um the res- the result that flowed from where that drive finished up that then allowed me to to be in a position to get a little lucky and hold that putt uh that flowed from a good target choice that's what it flowed from and so many of the the things that worked for me last week new south wales open were results of good targeting because if your targeting is good, then you uh, then all of your sh- potential shots are in a, in an acceptable area. And when I hit it into the water on the eleventh hole with my second shot on the par five, that was because I made a bad swing. 
But if I had, that was also the wrong club. If I had chosen the correct club, which was four iron, instead of trying to hit a fancy high cut two iron in there, the same swing that I made with that four iron is just short right of the green. And I could chip it up and likely make a birdie. Oh, you can, you can blame the caddy. Bogey, not yeah. because of my swing, because of my club choice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you could you could blame your caddy for that. Caddy, that's, that's right, Bryden. They get the big pull, pulling his own bag. Um, the, the just one one last uh, moment in that final round um, that I'm interested to hear your thoughts on is on 16, the par three. Uh, you've I think probably well, it's just it, your balls come up a little bit short. Nine times out of ten, your ball where it ended up is going to roll all the way down to quite a tough position but it hung up I was actually up at the green stand next to Warren Smith and <laughs> Brian's balls trickled off the front of the green and then stopped on the fringe and Warren's immediately gone oh it's, it's Fred Couples <laughs> <laughs> Hogan had Fred Couples in the one episode you're doing and, a lot Brian <laughs> um, and it was crucial like a bogey there could have uh, really put a lot of pressure on for those last couple of holes which are tough finishing holes at uh uh, it's all those variables you talked about, isn't it, Brian? Yeah, and they don't finish until the last. Of course you Yeah, you need a bit of luck. And like it, you can be sprinkled in that fairy dust I was talking about, but that really, I think, just gets you in contention. And things have got to go your way a little bit on those last few holes. Well, I, Absolutely. I, I remember talking to Peter Lonard when I did the thing about golf podcast with him. His entire career that he built may well have rested on his ball hitting an auto bin back left of the fifth green of the Australian in the Australian Open one year and bouncing back out onto the green. I think he made four or five. Birdied the last two, made the cut on the number. That got him into the tournament the following week. He played well the tournament the following. None of that would have happened if that rubbish bin hadn't been there. Quite quite extraordinary. The sliding doors rubbish bin. Yeah, absolutely. It is real sliding doors. <laughs> and it, and it, it is sort of that crazy. I wanted to ask you, Bryden, and I, I, I am – more than impressed with what you've done with your game and the results that you've seen. I really do congratulate you for it. It's a, you know, it's it, it's a different sort of thing to what DeChambeau's done, but it's no smaller in a lot of ways, particularly from the person who's actually doing it to radically change your golf game. But Bryson you, McPherson, you think? Bryson McPherson. <laughs> do, do, anyway, <laughs> you mentioned some of the young players. But we've got one that I think particularly stands out. Is young Elvis Smiley. I'd like to get your thoughts on him. But also this series of tournaments that we've had this summer, I feel like it could be pivotal in a whole lot of careers. The innovation of the TPS series, Rosebud and Bonnie Doom, we had fabulous finish at Rosebud and a really good week again at Bonnie Doom there. Just some thoughts on what's unfolded this summer under the circumstances and how those things might play into some of those young careers in coming years. I think most players look back on a moment, as I just sort of talked about there with Lonard or a period where... Some important things happen. I feel like that could be the case from this this summer that we've just had here in Australia. Well, I think that the development of the TPS events uh, is a good is a good thing for golf in Australia. I think it will disproportionately impact the girls in a positive way because the girls uh, we already as as the guys down here in Australia don't play in incredibly deep fields. But the girls, even more so, except for when they play their co-sanctioned events, they don't play in incredibly deep fields either. So I think when you put the girls in with the guys, uh, like at the TPS events, and they're directly competing, then the depth of those fields that the girls are going to have to compete against is going to disproportionately impact them in a positive way. And that's going to be really good for women's golf in Australia. Um, I think that that will be one of the main things that you'll see flow on so long as they can maintain the course on that. Um, I would like to see most of the events be like that, uh, have the pros, uh, the pro guys and the pro girls playing in the same fields. I think that would be, that would be good. Um, mainly cause it will, it will give the, the girls deeper fields to compete against and that'll be great for them. Uh, and great for their development because that's the only way that you get any better is by playing in deep fields against people who are better than you. Um, and, you know, I mean, for the, for the young guys coming through, you know, it's, it's tournament golf. It's, it's proper 72 hole tournament golf against seasoned pros who can play and guys we call journeymen. We undersell the talent of those players, don't we? To get the ball around the golf course between a set of numbers, somewhere between 68 and 74 pretty much every day. That's an incredible talent and skill. 
It is. It is. And it's that consistency that kind of I was talking about is what they're really good at. And it's what the young kids need to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, And the only way that they can learn it is by playing golf tournaments uh, with people that can do it. Um, You know, maybe the guys on Sunday saw something in, in my approach that was more consistent than theirs. And maybe that'll help them going forward. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to talk to them about it if they ever want to, but I don't think they need to. It's not a complicated, uh, it's not a complicated concept here. Uh, it's do the same thing over and over. That's, that's it. Um, and, but I mean, you know, I'm not really in the business of predicting fortunes when it comes to the, the, the young kids coming through. They're all really good. Um, but, uh, you know, only time will tell and only they can figure it out. There's no formula for this. Uh, yeah, exactly. And that's the thing is that the only formula is to be pretty good and then to go compete and trust yourself and stick to what you know. Um, and then only after that doesn't work can you then start embarking on something like a like a, a game development program or, or a reinvention program in, in some aspects. I mean, I think people are too quickly, uh, sorry, too quick to jump to the, I need to develop my game before they actually have any proof one way or the other, whether or not they need to. Um, and so my advice is to actually go and test your game by sticking to the same things, sticking to the same processes in how you swing it, but also how you play and how you compete first. And then once that doesn't work, then you can talk about developing stuff out. Um, and I think the guys that understand that instinctively uh, will be the guys that um, that do really well. Uh, and because by definition, the other guys will be lucky to succeed because they'll be down on various rabbit holes, uh, worrying about getting better all the time. Yeah. So you wouldn't recommend having a little grab bag of swing thoughts that you can change from <laughs> hole seven, to hole? The 747 like swing? What from, doesn't... <laughs> that sort of stuff? I would recommend having uh, a very short list of swing thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I guess... Uh, so the thing for Elvis, there's, and players have encountered it since time began and players will encounter it since to- until time ends if that ever comes, is that he, he clearly stands out in a bunch of different ways and so naturally he's going to get some attention, but there is no such thing as a can't miss kid. As the, mm. the story I wrote about him the other day yeah. is this: there is the, the the game is littered with dozens and dozens and hundreds of can't miss kids. Bryden, you were a can't miss kid at college, weren't you? You played on the same team as Jordan Spieth, and as you told me yourself, many at the time would have said Bryden's the one who's like he's the better player. And in terms so, of career, yeah. So, so I'll just correct you and say I didn't play on the team with Jordan, but I played against him. Sorry, against him. Um, yeah, because he Slight played at difference. University of Texas, and I was at University of Georgia. Georgia. So I was, mistake. so I was on the team with Russell Henley and Harris English and Hudson uh-huh. Swafford, who are no uh, great, no slouches, no slouches themselves, <laughs> as they to, to quote some Caddyshack there. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Look, I think that the the journey that I've been over the last year has been to remove the fact that I define myself by my golf results. Uh And I think that's a really healthy thing uh, to do. Um, But younger kids with all of the attention and expectation put on them tend to fall into that trap. Mm -hmm. And when you think about how that plays out, you've got to think about, what the actual consequences of that are, you know, because if a kid gets wrapped up in all that matters is how I play, he either burns himself out and then he's no use to anyone. Then he gets tossed aside. That happened to me multiple times with multiple people. Uh, and that's not a good experience. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Um, or they succeed. And then the, the, the bubble of entitlement that gets put around them i'm not saying that the guys themselves create it but there are people that will create that Mm. for you because it benefits them that's right um that includes everybody from golf coaches to managers to caddies to friends quote unquote friends i've seen the press golf to golf media everything right so you build that bubble around a kid and then 
what he is he turns into like a standoffish person that doesn't want anything to do and doesn't have any real relationships um at the price of what winning some golf tournaments mm. so for me that road that some of these kids get sent down never ends well and they're never able to get out of it uh because they by definition if they succeed at it yeah. they never realize that they're in it and so my advice for these kids is to just slow down a little bit yeah. uh take your time enjoy what you're doing don't be in a rush no one cares if you win a tournament when you first major when you're 25 or when you're 22 i think jordan is somewhat experiencing the repercussions of that at the moment mm. he was a superstar yeah always was in college always was going to be when we were playing amateur golf together and we were good friends and he had this total awesome run but then the inevitable question that gets asked after you do what he does is and then what and then what that's mm-hmm. right keep asking for more and so he starts asking himself that question mm-hmm. uh and he doesn't have an answer mm-hmm. because all anyone has ever told him is all that matters is winning golf tournaments mm-hmm. Well, I hate to break it to you, kids. It doesn't actually mean anything no. uh, because no one's. It, it doesn't actually have any real impact on the world unless you make it. So, I don't really buy into the idea that it's important how good these kids are when they're eighteen. I wish them the best, and uh, I'm glad that they enjoy playing golf, and I'm glad that they enjoy competing, and I hope that they keep going with it because. If you can hold those two things that you are, or three things that you're good at something, that you enjoy doing it, and that you enjoy doing it under a pressure, uh, pressure environment, if so long as you're doing those three things and that's what you care about, you're going to be successful. But if you ever get out of that, then you're not actually succeeding, even though your bank account may say otherwise. Very mature stuff, Mm Brian. And and you don't come to any of those conclusions by sitting back and just thinking you've got to live, don't you? That's lived experience talking. That's that's lived experience. That's what it is. Uh, And, you know, it's... And and, an active mind. You've actively participated in the protest yourself as well. A lot of people, particularly in that athletic world, and golf is no different, they do go into that bubble and the bubble cocoons them and looks after them. They don't think about any of this stuff because they don't have to. Well, they give up agency in a, in a sense. That's right. It's, you know, that's somebody else's job to make those decisions. So, you know, you've, you've had a part in your own growing up there and <laughs> full marks to you for yeah. that. Yeah. Well, and see, look, see, at the moment, because I've played some good golf over two months. Two podcasts in two days, man. Well, I mean, it's crazy. So <laughs> That's how look, you measure success. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, that's it. How many podcasts? Yeah. So I have now people extending their hand to welcome me back into that bubble. Uh-huh. And there is nothing I want in this world less than to do that. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, the people that are reaching out to me about management stuff and all these kinds of things, I am genuinely not interested. And like, because who cares? Mm. So there's going to be some Q schools. There's going to be some stuff. I would love to get a card and play on the Japan tour. That'd be awesome. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to continue playing and supporting Australian golf with literally everything I have. Uh, and that's, that's great. But I'm not interested in, in, in doing all this other stuff that supposedly defines success by other people's expectations. Yeah. Uh, well, you've yeah, done that, haven't yeah. you? You've played that game, haven't you? So you know how I've that played game. that game, yeah. played it, and it burned me time yeah. after time after yeah. time. Yeah, indeed. It's fabulous to hear all that. Um, yeah, the, the word that annoys me most in sort of modern culture is um, disruptor. Just this notion that you just be contrarian and that makes you interesting and different and mm. you know a target for success. Or what you're talking about there is genuine disruption, disrupting your own life, your own thought patterns, the way you go about things yourself. That's genuine disruption. You've come to this place and it's uh, fantastic to see. It's great to see you having some success. I know I've called you the hippie golfer before, but the game is is better and would be better if more people who played the game at this level thought more about some of this stuff the way you do, I think. Mm. And it is a great yeah. contribution to Australian golf yeah. um, 
it, it's great to have you back for these tournaments. And it, to me, it gives... We need to be talking to Mrs. McPherson. Yeah. <laughs> he's got, he's got right. no say in this decision. That's right. If we want him back, we've got to convince her. The Hawaiian tour is going to... Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, but that's yeah. right. She will inevitably be listening to this. At some okay. Time, so uh, if you Mrs. want to Mac. say anything... Then, yeah, Mrs. Yeah, Mac, uh, give him back. <laughs> yeah. Because, because it's created a great feel, like Bryden and, you know, your Marcus Frasers are yeah, back here much. and all that. That... Jeff Ogilvy, Jeff, Jeff Ogilvy, it, it's and these TPC uh, TPS. Yeah. Oh my goodness, <laughs> two, uh, two episode wow. penalty for you. Um, these TPS events have uh, really put new life into the Australasian PGA Tour, and it, it's starting to really take on a character of its own. Where you've got your personalities like Bryson, uh, Bryson. <laughs> wow, wow, Hogan, that's Bryson, and Couples. That's the trifecta you wouldn't have expected at the start um, of the day. I, I, I think uh, if I can be candid, I'll I'll invite two of those comparisons, but maybe <laughs> we, we, can, we, can, <laughs> we can cut that and whole I'll leave bit that out. Up to the listeners to decide what I'm out. talking about. Yeah. yeah anyway, I, 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 I made my point. <laughs> and having had golf taken away has been a part of that. Yes. And it's people in the UK back to golf this last couple of days. They've felt that as well. Having had tournament golf taken away. Part of it's been back at Concord as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's stuff. golf it's for the 80s, isn't it? Playing, it's playing in Bonnie Doon. Bonnie Doon. Great Dune, venue as well. Yeah, anyway. We've been at this for too long, Brian. It's been fantastic to talk to you. We won't be the last time we have you on. I always enjoy chatting with you. It always goes a direction that I don't expect, and that's what's so good about it. But as always, mate, did you double up on anything you told inside the ropes? I hope not. Uh, not really, no. Good. You guys got some fresh material. <laughs> Excellent. That's good to hear. So go and have a listen to Inside the Ropes. Go and have a listen to ours. Then tell us which one you thought was best. Great to have you aboard today, mate. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. And Adrian, great to have you aboard. Thank you. And uh, it was great to have Kari aboard. We thanked her. And uh, for anybody who's still listening, but thanks, man. It's been a long one, actually. It has been it? a long one. I'm going to cut a little bit out of this one. <laughs> thanks, no doubt. Episode 70 done and dusted. Episode 71 coming your way next week here on the Good Good Golf Podcast.